full of spam of urine. Uh, first of all, before we get started, we are fixing to get a nuts of old beer analysis. We're done with the safety and all that type of stuff. So when we test a urine in the laboratory, we do what's called the physical exam, the chemical exam, and the microscopic exam. That's everything that's done to a, to a UA specimen in the urinalysis laboratory. Now there are tests like a urine culture that's done back in micro, but I do want you to kind of see the broad picture. Physical exam, chemical exam, and microscopic exam. And I believe that's the next three chapters in your book in order. Physical, chemical, and microscopic exam. So everything we're talking about today is going to involve the physical exam of urine, okay? A lot of it is just common sense. The first thing about the physical exam we're going to talk about today is the color, okay? We're going to talk about the clarity. That's basically, is it cloudy, is it not cloudy, is it clear, is it hazy, all that. We're going to talk about a thing called specific gravity. And then I like, to, I mean, this is in your book. It's not talked about enough in my opinion, but sometimes we can judge a urine specimen as part of the physical characteristics by its odor. Yeah, right. So those are the four big things that I'm going to cover today. The color, the clarity, the specific gravity, and the odor of urine, all right? All right, in your book on page 60, the very first sentence, basically you might want to underline that, it says the physical exam of urine includes a determination of color, clarity, and specific gravity. Well, then, Remember I had yeah, over hold on. those three characteristics. Say, yeah, 60, yeah. I just didn't know. So moving on to the right hand column on page 60 under normal urine color. All right, everybody with me? Normal urine color in the right hand column. If we go down about three lines, this answers one of your very first objectives. It says common descriptions for urine color includes pale yellow, yellow, and dark yellow. And it does say care should be taken to examine the specimen under a good light source. So, I mean, you guys probably knew that before I told you today, right? Your urine should be a yellow color. Mm -hmm. Now, one person's urine may be dark yellow, another one's may be pale yellow. It all depends on how hydrated your body is, okay? It doesn't, usually dark yellow and yellow, there's not a lot to that other than how concentrated your urine specimen is. That's what we expect to see. But just remember, you're working in a urinalysis laboratory, and physicians that want to know things about urine is probably because there's something wrong with it, okay? So don't think that every urine specimen you're going to get is going to be pale yellow and clear, right? You're going to see some of the nastiest urines. Uh, we've tried to mock some in there today that we're going to show you in lab, but you'll see all kinds of different colors of things that we're going to talk about. Now it's going to tell you this in your book, but for every pathologic reason that a urine can be an abnormal color, there's usually also a normal reason that your urine can be that color, okay? If you've got, if you're a female and you've got a urine that's got a little bit of blood in it, okay, there's normal reasons for that. I don't have to get into that. But you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. Okay. There's even normal reasons why your urine can be green or blue, depending on if you're taking a certain medication. Okay? I'm taking that medication in my pants. I'm taking it in one. It's not that color. It's not that color, no. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying in every occasion. <laughs> okay. I'm not saying in every occasion, guys, but I'm just saying. There's you know, You'll read about this in your book. For example, if you've got a UTI, okay, and I, I think I covered this in intro, but if you're taking a drug called Peridine, or that's yeah, what you call it in the lab, it's yeah. probably going to, that's, that's basically a painkiller for it makes your like orange. infection. Yeah, because it had like a you know, classes, I have told the wrong information about that. Someone's on fire. For about five years, I thought Peridium was actually an antibiotic that was used for urinary tract infection. Somebody told me that, and I went with it. Okay. Anyway, I was wrong about that. Uh, Peridium is actually a painkiller that's used for urinary tract infections, and we've got a sample in there today that looks just like a Peridium sample, but it really creates havoc in the urinalysis laboratory because, first of all, it, it highly pigments your urine, where it makes it a thick uh, there's a certain degree of thickness mm -hmm. to it, and it makes it this orange red color to yes. where as soon as you put the dipstick down in it, all of your pads look like that color. 
and it just all of your results come out being positive, but it, it's false positives for everything. All right. So that's a, that's one thing that uh, we see a lot of times in the laboratory. I got a question. How about the upgrade? When you send it back, I don't know, over at Fort Ives, if they had a specimen that has too much blood in it or something like that, like too much blood, would you send it down and then do our next day? Yes. Okay, would you do that with Peridium too or no? It won't change it. It won't change it? Nope. Okay, gotcha. You can, okay. You can centrifuge a specimen with Peridium in it and it's still the same color. But but uh, but what you are right. If you got a specimen that's loaded with blood and stuff, mm -hmm. you can spin it down because if it's just real dark red and you put a dipstick in it, everything's positive. So a lot of labs will spin it down first. You'll have a huge cell button at the bottom, and then you can dip it and get accurate readings. And believe it or not, even though all that blood is at the very bottom, it'll still read positive for blood or plus. Okay. Uh, so that's your point. <coughs> Excuse right. me. There is a there is a substance in your body. Yeah, yeah. Substance in urochrome. Yep, yep. Substance in your body called urochrome that is responsible for making your urine yellow. Okay, urochrome. Remember that it's a bolded word in the right hand column on page sixty. Now there are some other pigments, but urochrome is the main one. If you've got to know one of them, remember urochrome. That's the one that makes your urine yellow. We will briefly talk about a couple of others, but your home is the main one there. Okay, second objective. I'm on page 61, first full paragraph. It says, because your chrome is excreted at a constant rate, the intensity of the yellow color in a fresh urine specimen will give a rough estimate to urine concentration. A dilute urine will be pale yellow, and a concentrated specimen will be dark yellow. Guys, you know, you probably have experienced that with your own urine, right? If you're dehydrated, your urine's going to be real concentrated, it'll be dark yellow. If you're hydrated, your urine pretty much looks like water, it'll have a pale yellow color to it, all right? And again, if your chrome is excreted at a constant rate, if you got a lot of water in your system, it dilutes it. If you don't have a lot of water in your system, you're, it's going to be yellow. Now, a specimen will turn a darker yellow if you leave it at room temperature for a certain amount of time. Your chrome will actually increase because it's being exposed to oxidized air or oxygen. Okay? So the longer you leave it, your, a, a specimen will turn a darker yellow if you leave it out at room temperature for a period of time. Uh, Curtis, when you're talking about oxidation, it's like a spring will come to mind the, the metabolism. There's more metabolism happening than more urochrome shows up. But urochrome is like indication of metabolism. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah. Does that even happen with the lid on? With the lid on, yes. Yep. Okay, next paragraph, page 61. Two additional pigments, urourethrin and urobilin, are also responsible in the urine in much smaller quantities. I, I said responsible, I meant present in smaller quantities and it contributes little to the color uh, of normal fresh urine. What you have to worry about about urourethrin is, you, you guys, when you read about it, it's when you refrigerate a specimen. This pigment called urourethrin, you can take any normal specimen, if you put it in a refrigerator, that urourethrin is responsible for calling this crystal called amorphous to accumulate, and it makes your urine really cloudy. And if you take a refrigerated specimen that's been in a refrigerator overnight, say in a conical tube, you'll see this white precipitate at the bottom. Sometimes it's pink, depending on if it's an acid or an alkaline urine, but it gets in the way of everything. You'll spin that urine down and you will think you're the sickest person in Darwin County, okay? You'll say, what is all that stuff in my urine? But if you just let it come to room temperature and fix it again, it's like almost all of it will go away, okay? It is a false, it, 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 it's a crystal that basically becomes larger and in greater amounts simply because of the refrigeration. It has nothing to do with the patient, okay? But it gets so big that when we put it on a microscope slide, all you see is this amorphous everywhere and you can't see the stuff you need to see, like white blood cells and red blood cells and cast and trichomonas, you name it. So you have to make sure that you let that urine come back to room temperature before you test it. 
Okay, dark yellow. We're going to start talking about abnormal urine colors and somewhat what causes normal colors. Uh, last paragraph in the left-hand column on 61, it says dark yellow or amber urine may not always signify normal concentrated urine, but it can be caused by the presence of abnormal pigment in bilirubin. When the bilirubin is present, it will be detected during the clinical examination. Okay, so when we're talking about bilirubin and protein. If you have a urine that, I call it worse than dark yellow, usually it'll almost be to the amber color, that is an indication that there may be bilirubin in the urine. You gotta be real careful for that because if you got a urine that has a lot of bilirubin in it, it's indicative of some sort of thing going on with the liver, which that could be hepatitis. So you wanna use, your book is gonna tell you, make sure you use standard precautions, all right? Anyone that has liver problems, a lot of times, if they turn jaundice, you see that color in everything. You see it in their eyes and their sclera, you see it on their skin, their urine also looks the same color. And guess what? When you draw a blood sample on them and you spin their blood, their plasma and their serum looks that color too. Okay? So it's across the board, that color. Now, one little thing about the physical exam of urine that can tip you off if it's truly bilirubin or not. If you'll take that conical tube and you've got a lid on it, if you'll turn it up and down lightly, not hard, but just lightly, there will be a lot of yellow foam in the urine. A lot of yellow foam indicates there's a lot of bilirubin in that specimen. Likewise, if you turn it up and down a couple of times and it's a lot of white foam, that indicates protein in the urine. Now, you can never turn out that result based on that. It's just a little tip for you, and it does talk about that in your book. White foam, white foam versus yellow foam. If it's a normal urine, you may turn it and see a little bit of foam, but it'll go away, okay? If it's truly bilirubin or protein, you'll see an abundance of that foam. Okay, first full paragraph in the right-hand column on page 61 again starts talking about peridium. Now there is another name for peridium, guys. I'm sorry, but you're probably going to need to know it in case it's on your registry. It's a black bolded word on page 61 called phenazopyridine. Now right beside that it says that's a brand name of peridium. Everybody with me on that? Such frequently encountered in the UA lab is the yellow orange specimen caused by peridium. Uh, basically, it says this causes a thick orange pigment. It obscures the natural color of the specimen. And it goes on to basically talk about it causes problems with your major problems with your chemical exam. Moving on to red, pink, or brown urine. Last section on page 61. One of the most common causes of abnormal urine color is the presence of blood. Okay, now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Page 62, first full paragraph. So besides red blood cells in a uh, urine specimen, there's a couple of things you have to worry about. You have to worry about hemoglobin and myoglobin. All right? So I'm going to write these down on the board because I've I'm, the book kind of goes through this, but there are three things that will cause blood to be in your, or it will cause your blood to test positive in a urine specimen. One, of course, is going to be blood or red blood cells. This is called, there's a word for this, it's called hematuria. Hematuria is red blood cells in the urine, okay? But there's two other substances. One of them is hemoglobin. You guys have heard of that before, and another one is myoglobin. Again, any of these three substances, if you dip a urine, will test positive for blood. But the only one that will make sense to you, because do you agree, if you test positive, if you have blood in your urine, do you agree you should see red blood cells on the microscopic? Right? If you have hemoglobin or myoglobin, you may have a four plus test for blood in the urine, but you will see no red blood cells in the microscopic. Yep. So if I've got uh, hemoglobin in the urine, can't see the cells, I could, I could indicate hemoglobin in the urine then? Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so there's a good chart in your book that lets us distinguish this. It's real easy, guys. Basically, if a urine is red and cloudy, okay, if it's red and hazy where you can't see through it, that indicates that more than likely there are intact red blood cells, right? If it is red and clear, then you've got to determine whether it's hemoglobin or myoglobin, all right? Now, there's a chart at the bottom of page 62 that says, okay, we have a red urine specimen. Everybody see the block I'm on? All right. If it's red and cloudy, that means when we do the microscopic, we should see red blood cells in the urine. There's that word we talked about, hematuria. Okay? If that urine specimen is clear, it indicates either hemoglobin or myoglobin. Now, the best thing to do, if it was me, if you're doing a urine specimen on somebody, more than likely, they also have a blood sample down in the lab. So you can just walk over to chemistry. You remember I told you, in chemistry, the first thing they do is spin down the blood, all right? Walk over to chemistry and say, look, I've got a urine specimen on Britt Turner over there that's red and clear. I just want to know if it's hemoglobin or myoglobin. So you can pull that green top or that red top or whatever tube of blood that they drew, look at the plasma or serum. If that's hemoglobin in the urine, more than likely their plasma or their serum is hemolyzed as well, all right? You can have a hemolyzed blood sample that is not because of the blood draw, all right? Some people actually hemolyze their cells internally, right? That's called intravascular hemolysis. You can't do anything about that. That's true hemolysis to where when you spin a red top tube or a green top tube, their plasma is red, and even though you're going to have that sample redrawn, your redraw is still going to be hemolyzed. Okay, it's, it's a natural process that occurs. Now, will you ever do that in your analysis? Nope, you'll just report it out as red and clear, red and cloudy, but if the urine is red, you've got to do a microscopic on it automatically. Most places are going to make you, as we talk on further in this book, you're gonna understand there are certain parameters that cause us to have to do a microscopic, no matter what, okay? read in your book and it's going to tell you well why why am I concerned about hemoglobin versus myoglobin okay myoglobin is something that basically it occurs in your urine because of muscle damage let's say that somebody let's say somebody gets taken to the ER and they fell off of a building okay and they're really hurt real bad or scaffolding fell down on them <coughs> there is a substance in your muscles that's called myoglobin that will be produced the reason physicians have to worry about it is because it's toxic to your tubules right have you guys ever heard of watched a movie or whatever and somebody's in a real traumatic accident the first thing the doctor will say is they're like you got to make sure the kidneys are still going to work right because if the kidneys shut down okay then the two, if there's certain substances that are toxic to the kidneys, and if the kidneys shut down, you're in a lot of big trouble there, okay? So they have to worry about that myoglobin. There's even a specific test that you do in the urinalysis laboratory. It's one that you generally are gonna have to get the procedure manual out because you don't do it a lot, but where you actually try to detect myoglobin in the urine, all right? Okay, moving down to brown or black urine. The last section in the left-hand column on page 62. There's two conditions that will cause your urine to be black. I've never seen a black urine working in your house laboratory ever, okay? But I'm not saying you won't. It's a real rare condition. And even if you have what I'm fixing to tell you about, it doesn't necessarily mean your urine will be black when it gets to the laboratory, okay? But these are odd occurrences, but it seems like they always wanna know about black urine. The first thing is, is generally, you will never have a black urine unless you let it sit at room temperature for a little while, okay? Well, what did I tell you about letting urine sit? It's Urines, even though, uh, urine can come down to the lab and be a routine specimen, you don't want urine sitting for a long time, right? Remember what I told you? You let urine sit and your lab starts smelling like a moment, okay? So, when I worked, urines were done static. 
Okay, if I was working in your analysis, I didn't care. If it was ordered routine, I'm doing those things as quick as they come in because I don't want that urine sitting at room temperature very long. But there's a couple of conditions to where if the urine stands at room temperature, it may have came down to the lab yellow, but when it's exposed to air, it, turn, it starts turning brown and then it actually can get to a black color. One of those patients that causes this or the sickness that causes this is a patient that has a malignant melanoma, okay? That's called melanin in the urine. Melanin in the urine can cause that urine to become black upon standing at room temperature. Now again, that doesn't mean every patient with malignant melanoma, you're gonna see a black urine. Now there is another condition that's, in, that's caused by an inborn error of metabolism called alcaptonuria. Alcaptonuria. There is a substance that can be in your urine called homogentistic acid, and it can cause your urine to turn black as well. Right? We're going to talk all about this condition in chemistry. All right? Basically, these are people that have enzyme deficiencies, and because they're lacking an enzyme, they can't convert amino acids or break them down properly, right? So again, for your test or whatever, two things that could cause your urine to turn black, a malignant melanoma, or there's a condition called alcaptonuria, all right? And that again, that's an inborn error of metabolism. Everything I'm telling you guys, it's in your book, it's in your reading, okay? So it also says that medications producing brown to black urine include epilodopa. Yep. Is that a blood pressure medicine? I, I think I'm on that, but my urine's not that good. Yeah, but how many times have you let your urine turn to sit at room temperature? That's sit true. On no, oh. None. Yeah. I didn't know much of that is all caused. I will pee in a cup, and I'm That's interesting. Right now. I'll let guys, you guys know. <laughs> remember all these colors that I'm going over, even though I would never. I mean, if you showed me anybody's urine that turned black, but just remember, for every abnormal urine color, there is a lot of times a perfectly logical explanation that is not even pathologic that caused that urine to be that color. I just don't want you to leave here today thinking, oh, like my urine's a little dark yellow, I probably got liver <laughs> failure, okay? I just want you to know, it, and it tells you in your book, for every abnormal color, there is also a non-pathologic reason that can cause your urine to be that color, all right? So remember that. That's why they want us looking at microscopics and stuff, so tell those physicians to make sure that it's not because of a medication. Medication will make your urine turn crazy colors, okay? But I'm not gonna require you to know those medications for the test, all right? Okay. We gotta know enough stuff, we're not pharmacists. So, but I do want you just in the back of your mind to realize medications can cause a lot of abnormal The only medication I want you to remember because I think that they'll ask it on your registry is what? Peridium. Peridium. Remember peridium, all right? Peridium can cause that orange red color. But I'm not going to ask you about methyl dopa and all of that type of stuff. Okay, blue green urine. I haven't seen this color very often, but I do want to read about it to you. I'm in the right hand column on 62. Causes of blue green urine uh, can be caused by an organism or bacteria called Pseudomonas. Mm -hmm. uh, this can be in uh, intestinal tract infections, but it can also be caused by certain breath uh, deodorizers, barrettes, can result in a green urine as well. Right. Blue green urine, oh, I would just keep in the back of my head, certain Pseudomonas infections can cause your urine to be blue green, but also remember. I mean, I literally do not remember ever testing a blue green urine, okay? And I've done a lot of them. So we talked about all the colors. Now we're gonna move on to clarity. Clarity is next. Your objective, it says you need to be able to identify common terminology used to identify clarity. So under the clarity section on page 62, you'll drop down about seven or eight lines. It says common terminology used to report clarity includes clear, hazy, cloudy, turbid, and milky. Those are all terminology used. Most places, or most labs, what they'll do when you're resulting clarity, you'll have a little drop down box in the computer, and in that box will be all of these words. You can just pick it. Okay. 
the labs may be a little bit different. There may be somebody that uses you know, a, a word that's a little bit different from one lab to another, but in general, that's the terminology used to define clarity. There's normal clarity, it says usually freshly voided urine should be clear, okay? The biggest non-pathologic reason for a cloudy urine, that we'll talk about in the book, is that term I used earlier, amorphous. And it's because that urine has been sitting in the refrigerator. That can cause a urine to be cloudy when it has nothing to do with a sickness or a pathologic reason, okay? Don't remember anything bad, just remember refrigeration will cause a urine to turn cloudy. Okay, pathologic turbidity. I'm in uh, the last part of left hand column on page 63 under pathologic turbidity. It says the most commonly encountered pathologic causes of a specimen to be turbid is red blood cells, white blood cells, and bacteria. Okay, moving to the right hand column, first full paragraph, it says the clarity of a specimen certainly provides a key to the microscopic examination of results because the amount of turbidity should correspond with the amount of material observed underneath the microscope. Right. You remember what I was telling you earlier about there are certain things in your analysis that's called reflex testing that you as a tech will have to make a decision about. Now, I'm just going from where I worked. Places are a little bit different. I talked to Jason about what their rules were. But there's certain criteria when you do a urine specimen that automatically require you to have to do a microscopic. Okay. There's certain criteria where you don't have to do the microscopic, where you can look at a urine, if it's yellow and clear, and you do a dipstick on it, and it's negative for everything, or everything comes out normal, you don't have to look at that underneath the microscope. But you're going to be happy on those, on those specimens, okay? Because just trust me, it saves you a lot of work, all right? But certain parameters automatically require that you do a microscopic. One of them is if the specimen, where I work anyway, if it is not clear. If that spe even if you put hazy, we had to do a microscopic on it. Because think about it, something's causing that, right? There's something in it causing you to, to not report that out as clear. Even if it's amorphous, all right, you need to at least know, look, the specimen's loaded with amorphous. Now, if I'm a supervisor, I'm going to say, are you sure it wasn't cold when you tested it, you know? But, uh, you know, if the specimen is cloudy, you've got to do a microscopic on it every time, all right? Even if it's negative for everything on the chemical exam, you have to do it, yeah. Did you create a slide or stain or what? Uh, we, didn't, we didn't stain it. You just actually spin the urine down. You'll get sediment at the bottom usually, and you just get your, we're going to do it in lab. You're going to get you one of those squeegees, and you're going to mix it all up, and then you're going to put a drop on a microscope slide, and then look at it underneath the microscope. The more cloudy it is, probably the more stuff you will see, okay? If it's just slightly cloudy, you may not see a lot of stuff. If it's super cloudy, I expect that thing to be loaded with white blood cells, maybe red blood cells, bacteria, a bunch of squamous epithelial cells, all of that type of stuff can be going on, okay? So turbidity is important, and again, we've kind of doctored some specimens today to where hopefully you'll see that. Okay, specific gravity. <clears throat> That's the third part of the chemical exam. One of them is you need to define the word specific gravity. So I'm in the right-hand column on page 63, drop down to the third paragraph, starts with the word specific gravity. It's defined as the density of a solution compared with the density of a similar volume of distilled water at a similar temperature. got some key terms up there that you need to be aware of. They're bolded. You've got a term called isopheneric, hypopheneric, and hyperpheneric. All right? Hyperpheneric, that just means the urine's concentrated. Hypo, it's not concentrated. That term, isopheneric, I'm going to read that to you. I'm in, the first, I'm in that first full paragraph under specific gravity. 
It says the specific gravity of the plasma filtrate entering the glomerulus is 1.010. The term isothenuric is used to describe urine with a specific gravity of 1.010. The reason that's so important, this will probably be the last time you hear about it other than on your exam, the reason it's so important is if the plasma filtrate is 1.010 entering the glomerulus, if your specific gravity is 1.010, if the patient has the right symptoms, that means there was no concentration done to your urine specimen. You see what I'm saying? When you voided urine, it was the same specific gravity as the plasma ultrafiltrate, okay? That can tell doctors a lot of information about the renal concentrating ability of the kidneys, okay? A lot of patients that have severe renal disease they will have the same specific gravity in the urine as they did as before, before it became urine. Do you understand what I'm saying? The kidneys were not doing their job concentrating the urine. So that word isothenuric, even though I don't think you'll ever see it at clinicals, no one will ever ask you about it except me, okay? Remember that word. I don't expect you to remember it fully, but I would hope maybe if you see it on a multiple choice test, you would recognize that word, okay? Again, that's one of those deals where I'm trying to kind of teach to the test in case they were to ask you that question. But I do want you to remember, hyperthenuric, that's concentrated specimen. Hypo, it's not concentrated. Now there's a good box uh, two good boxes at the bottom of page 63 that also answer objectives that tell you all of the stuff that they call are non-pathologic causes of turbidity versus pathologic causes of turbidity. Let's look at table 4, TAC 3 at the bottom of page 63. Now, what I told you so far about non-pathologic reasons is I told you, what word did I tell you to remember? Refrigeration, right? That's a non-pathologic now there are other things, but I told you the main one, okay? So I just wanna discuss a few of these other things. If a specimen is loaded with squamous epithelial cells, that's usually from a routine specimen, a lot of times that is taken from a female, okay? You'll see lots of squamous epithelial cells. They are totally normal, but if there's enough of them, they can cause the specimen to be clouded. Another thing is mucus. Okay, there can be a lot of mucus in the specimen. Again, everything I'm telling you right now is non-pathologic. It doesn't mean that the patient's sick. A specimen that has fecal contamination, you won't see that very often. Uh, radiographic <laughs> contrast media, that means a patient has had something done in x-ray, okay? They've had a chemical put in there that's causing the specimen to be clouded. Talcum powder from gloves that happen to actually artificially get in the urine for whatever reason, okay? Certain vaginal creams, uh, semen, you know, I mean, again, this is just off the wall stuff that would be super, super rare. I will tell you several times this semester, I want you to always remember, urine is toxic to sperm. If you ever see sperm or urine specimen, it will be dead. It will not be swimming around, okay? And that's just something too important to, re important to remember because if you work in urinalysis, you will see sperm in urine specimen. Okay? but they will always be dead. A lot of places, they don't even care if you report it out or not, okay? But I do want you to know you will see that occasionally. Okay, and then for the pathologic causes of urine turbidity, we went over most of these. I think the only one that I told you is if you have a patient that has a severe yeast infection, that will also cause the urine to be cloudy or turbid. something in the lab, I'll be right back so you can have us.
Okay, guys, so we talked about specific gravity. There's multiple ways to measure specific gravity. If you go to work at a doctor's office or in a clinic, you won't even have to worry about it because there's a pad on your dipstick that measures specific gravity, okay? So a lot of the stuff that I'm fixing to go over with you, you may not ever see, but there are multiple ways to measure specific gravity. So I wanna talk about it. But the first thing is, is I want you to understand what specific gravity is and not just try to memorize the word specific gravity. We talked about that for a long time. All it is is how concentrated the urine specimen is, okay? So we've got to figure out how concentrated <coughs> it is. Well, how do we do that when the stuff that concentrates the urine is invisible, okay? It's su such small molecules, we can't see it. So how do we determine, other than just gradually saying, well, he said the urine's dark yellow and there wasn't much of it, so they're probably dehydrated, which means it's concentrated. The things that we're looking at in a urine to see how concentrated it is, the main thing they're worried about is sodium and chloride molecules, okay? But there are other things that can concentrate, solutes that are in a urine that can cause it to be concentrated. Everybody remember what I told you, the number one thing that is a solute in urine. Anybody remember what it was called? Not sodium or chloride molecules, they're real small, but there's something that contributes to the solutes of a urine specimen. Remember I told you amino acids are broken down into urea. Remember that chemical I told you about yes. urea, okay? So you can have urea, sodium and chloride molecules, and there's all kinds of other organic things that can be in there as well. Now, if I ask you what's the number one thing that urine is made of, what is it? Urea. urea. No. Water. 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 <laughs> Water is the number one thing, but urea is the number one solute, Sol yeah. okay? But don't forget, you know, don't lose sight of the big picture. 95% of a urine specimen is water. Okay. All right, so in order to measure these dissolved contents, I think I've already told you this story, but I'm gonna tell it to you again. When I was in the Navy, I went to the Dead Sea, okay, when I was in the military. And the Dead Sea, you can basically, it's one of the only seas I know that you can jump in and you don't have to be able to swim, okay? Because you will float. There's so much salt content in the Dead Sea that if you throw something in it, it's really hard for it to sink, okay? Because there's so much salt in it. That's why they call it the Dead Sea, all right? So going off of that principle, do you not agree that if we could get something in urine specimens, something that's real, real light, determine on whether it sank or whether it floated would determine how many dissolved molecules was in that specimen, okay? Now this is of historical note. You will never see another one of these except in this class. But this is called a, a, a basically a urinometry, okay? And what this is, this is that float I was telling you about. That's probably mercury in that thing, so don't tell me until I showed you this. Right. What? Anyway, graduated cylinder, right? We put urine in this specimen. Mm -hmm. This has a certain weight to it. If I put water in here, this is going to sink down to the bottom. If I put urine that's loaded with, with uh, sodium and chloride molecules, maybe a diabetic that has lots of glucose in it, it's not going to sink, it's going to ride high. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we can determine that by how far this float either sinks to the bottom, which is water, or it rides up high. And then they've got calibrated grids up here in order to determine what the specific gravity is. This is how they used to do specific gravity. Unheard of anymore. In fact, in your book, it's under a box that says historical note. You see that urinometer? Okay. Yeah. But we actually have one of these. I wanted to show it to you because I think this is the best way to help you make sense of specific gravity. But we don't have time to do this, okay? First of all, it requires a lot of urine to fill that up, okay? <laughs> Just to drop this in it to get a specific gravity reading only. Now we've got technology to where we can determine the specific gravity from one drop of urine. So there's no need to fill up this huge graduate room. This isn't a big one, but you know what I'm saying. I'm right. So, got yeah, there. The uh, technology of which you speak that we have today for a single drop, would that be like a refractometer? Yep, a refractometer or even a dipstick. The dipstick has got a square on it. And if you only have one drop of urine and that doctor's wanting to know what the specific gravity is, take one drop of urine and add to that little pad on that dipstick. Okay, and that'll tell you the specific gravity. 
And we'll be using refractometers today. Okay, I'm on page 64 under refractometry. Right at the top of that. And this is one of your objective. I think it's objective 12. It says refractometry determines the concentration of dissolved particles in a specimen by measuring the refractive index. This is a comparison of the velocity of light in air with the velocity of light in a solution. So that's actually the definition of a refractive index. Next paragraph, the refractometer provides the distinct advantage of determining specific gravity using a very small volume of specimen. It says temperature corrections are not necessary. The only problem is, is with a refractometry, you can have certain things that will cause a refractometer to give you a false, abnormally high reading. One of those things, and it tells you this in your reading, is radiographic contrast media. Look with me on page 65, very first sentence on page 65. It says, abnormally high results greater than 1.040 are seen in patients who have recently undergone a polygram. It says this is caused by the excretion of injected radiographic contrast media. And it also says patients who are receiving dextran or other high molecular weight IV fluids are, will produce urine with an abnormally high specific gravity. So here's what the deal is, guys. A specific gravity, if I took the specific gravity of water, it'll be 1.000, okay? If you ever do a specific gravity on a urine and you get a result that is less than 1.003, that is not urine, okay? Somebody's doctored with it. And that's one of the things you can test for on a drug screen to see if somebody's tampered with a urine specimen. But if we want to calibrate the refractometer, which we may do today, if you'll add a drop of distilled water to it, it should read 1.000, all right? A, a specimen that is very dilute, let's say somebody's been drinking fluids all day, the specific gravity should be, uh, and I'm just gonna put this where it makes sense. Water, 1.005, okay? This would be a very dilute urine. 1.030, this is a concentrated urine. Specific gravity is always reported out with a one, with a decimal, and it goes three places to the right, all right? Again, 1.000 should be water, 1.005 should be a dilute urine, 1.030 would be a very concentrated urine. If you're using a refractometer and you ever get a result like 1.050 or something like that, something's crazy. You need to call the floor and say, look, did they just have a polygram done? Or did they have something, are they on some sort of medication that's given us these crazy results? What's a polygram? Radiographic contrast media where they're looking at, like they're looking at your back or they're looking at a spine. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert. I just know it's called, there's something that x-ray techs have to do to where they inject radiographic contrast media where they can get a better picture mm -hmm. if they do send them through yeah, a CAT scan. They make you drink right. something. You drink it. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No, with the ID, but I felt like I got so hot. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I thought I peed on myself. No. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I, I drank it. it sounds like and a then whole they're like, experience. you're going to feel like you peed your pants, but I promise you didn't. I was like, I, like, I, was like, I just peed myself. She's like, no, you didn't. I was like, are you that? sure? So the refractometer has some issues, right? Do y'all not agree? There's things that can give you false readings for a, a refractometer. When I worked, we had to do every specific gravity under a refractometer, okay? We could not use the strip. The strip had a pad on it. But back then, that pad wasn't as accurate as it is now. So even though we're gonna use a refractometer today, I really doubt that any of you will have to, when you go to clinicals, use a refractometer. You're gonna take it off of the pad because guess what? That pad is not affected by radiographic because I'm gonna tell you the principle that the pad uses, and it actually detects ions in the urine, okay? Ions means stuff that has a charge. 
But you write the abbreviation for sodium, you got a little plus sign there, right? Mm -hmm. Chloride, you got a little minus sign there, right? That means it's an ion and it produces a charge. The pad now is developed in a way to where the, react, the reaction will only detect ions. So there's some other stuff that it won't detect. Remember urea that contributes so much to a specific gravity? It doesn't come into play when you're using the pad. So most places prefer the pad now, okay, over the refractometer. But because we got to have a lab today, and I'll make it, uh, I'm going to let you use the refractometer. I imagine in a couple more editions, the refractometer will become in the historical notes section, okay, with the advances of technology. Okay, page 65. Um, I, this is just an example of using the refractometer, how you do the test. Look on page 65, look at that circle. You know, I call it a curtain, but do you see how the curtain drops down? Like for example, it says like that specific gravity reading would be 1.030. You agree? Everybody see in that left-hand column? And you may be asking, what's that right-hand side? What's all those numbers over there? You can also measure something called total protein using a refractometer, all right? We don't do it, it's unheard of, but I just want you to understand what that other grid is. Because when you guys are looking at the refractometer today, I'm gonna to be saying, I look at it first and I've gotta figure it out, but I'll say, okay, I want, as you're looking in it, look at the grid on the left side as you're looking in it. Because the grid that'll be on the other side will be a grid that measures total protein content. I don't, we're not even going to discuss that, okay, not at this point. Osmolality. Uh, they do ask on one of your objectives about osmolality. That is another way that detects basically how concentrated the substance is. Uh, some labs, they have what's called, a, you know, I, I know I've talked about it in chemistry, they have what's called a urine osmolality machine or osmolarity machine, and it detects how many sodium and chloride molecules are in that urine specimen. It's based off of freezing point depression. Remember, that's one of the colligative properties, right? Freezing point depression. Okay, let's talk about the reagent strip for specific gravity. As far as how it works, I'm in the right-hand column on 66, going into the first full paragraph. So the reagent strip reaction is based on a change in what's called the dissociation constant. This is where they use a polyelectrolyte and an alkaline medium. This polyelectrolyte that's in that pad, it ionizes, okay? And based on how many ions are in the urine specimen, it's going to produce hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions make the pH go Acidic. Okay, anytime high hydrogen ions are produced, your pad is going to become acidic and they have an indicator that can make that pad change colors. So in other words, the more acidic that pad becomes, that's proportional to how many ions was in that urine specimen that produces hydrogen ions. It says the polyelectrolyte ionizes, releasing hydrogen ions in proportion to the number of ions in solution. The higher the concentration of it in the urine, the more hydrogen ions are released, which will lower the pH of the pad. Now again, guys, when you go to clinicals, this is one thing that we'll talk about before you go or whatever. We're teaching you the theory about how those pads change, okay? If, if you're working with a tech in your analysis, they may not remember this, okay? I mean, you may be curious and you may want to know, hey, I remember Mr. Britt talking about this polyelectrolyte that's in the pad that basically ionizes and causes hydrogen ions to be released and stuff. Even the tech you're working with is probably not going to be aware of that, okay? They may have knew it at one time, but they've already passed their registry. You see what I'm saying? And so don't think that they're going to be an expert on every single reaction that happens on that this pad. Because I'll tell you what I would have told a student when I was doing clinicals, if a student would have asked me, like, hey, will you explain this reaction to me? I would have said, look, you're welcome to go over there and get the package insert out of the bottle that will explain that. But I would have said, all I know is, is the more yellow that pad becomes, the lower the pH. See what I mean? It's like, they're at a point where they've done it so long 
So I just want you to understand, not every person that works in a lab is gonna know this information. Again, they may do it at one time, but it gets to a point where they'll be working and it's all about how many urines they can do in an hour, okay? And so remember that when you go to clinicals. But for your registry, they very well can ask you a question about what is the reaction that causes you to get a specific reading off of the dipstick? Okay, so that's why you've got to know it. It's just a theory-based question. And again, you know, it's all about these little pads and what causes them to change colors. But it's not magic, okay? There's a reason they change color, and there's a different reaction for every test. And again, we'll talk all about that in the next chapter. Okay, let's move on to odor. Odor. I actually think this is pretty important. Uh, if you look at us, you know, a lot of them said, well, they don't really include odor. Uh, under odor, drop down three lines. It says a fresh voided urine specimen should have a faint aromatic odor. It says as the specimen stands, the odor of ammonia will become prominent. This is because of the breakdown of urea. It says causes of unusual odors include bacterial infections. Uh, says this can cause a strong unpleasant odor similar to ammonia. There's a condition called diabetic ketones, or you may have heard of it as diabetic ketoacidosis. That's sweet smell. All right. That's where the urine actually has a real sweet smell, a fruity smell to it. They even say it's somewhat pleasant, but unfortunately it means your patient is very, very sick. Okay, if you ever smell a, a fruity smell to the urine specimen, that's not good. You don't want it. you don't want any people to be in ketoacidosis. That's like a diabetic. That's really a bad situation. Now, there's a lot of other things and I, uh, that can make your urine have abnormal colors. So there's a good uh, for abnormal smells to it. If you look at Table Four, Tax Six, on page sixty-seven, the first thing it says is normal urine will have an aromatic smell. Bacterial problems uh, will have a foul ammonia like smell. A patient that's in diabetic ketoacidosis, the urine will smell fruity or sweet. Now, these are some of the rare ones, but we will talk all about this in chemistry about these, these other ones, okay? Because there are, again, certain people that have the inability to break down amino acids, it causes abnormal smells of the urine. There's one called maple syrup urine disease, where the urine will smell like maple syrup. Have I ever smelled it? No, but it is a condition that's rare that does happen. There's another one that makes the smell uh, uh, of urine be mousy. There's another one rancid. There's even one that's listed as sweaty feet. That is an inborn error of metabolism that we will talk about called isovaleric acidemia. We're gonna talk about that in chemistry. Uh, there's one that actually has a cabbage smell to it. And then the one that I want you to really know, because it'll happen to you more than any other one probably, is if you smell bleach. Okay. What kind of contamination? Somebody, it somebody contaminated their own? It's caused by contamination. Of bleach. Somebody put somebody bleach. Somebody pouring bleach oh. in their urine. Oh, so it's like a, okay. Yeah, Actual it's bleach. a well-known, okay. it's a well <laughs> I was about to say, I was like, what are they doing? No, it's someone, it's someone that is trying to taint all the results and it, usually they're not worried about what their urine results are they're worried about what their drug That's screen right. is and so if you ever uh and you'll smell it and i have smelled it before in the lab <laughs> where i've got a specimen and as soon as you open it there's nothing that should make your urine there's nothing pathologic or anything like that that should make your urine smell like bleach other than somebody pouring bleach in the urine to mask it That's crazy. I I worked at a uh, yeah, you guys can talk to Wendy about that, but when people are given drug what? screens, they have to do everything, especially those ones that are called chain of custody drug screens like we mentioned. You got to be real careful on that because they even rig the bathrooms where there's no faucets on the sink mm -hmm. and where if anything touches that uh, that uh, water that's in the commode, it'll make it turn like blue. They'll have food coloring dyes in it and all kinds of stuff to where you cannot, they're, they're trying to do everything possible to make someone not try to manipulate that specimen. Right. Okay. Where, like, but, uh, I, did, I did a clinical at, North, at the North Little Rock VA when I was going to UAMS and it was a toxicology lab because they would test a lot of those people for drugs. And uh, 
I mean, just over and over, we would have these urine cups. And I, I mean, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say probably one out of every 20 had bleach poured in. Okay. Those are the people that knew they were going to be positive. You know, so right. like, I mean, what do you got to lose? Does it right? affect the results? I mean, does it? Yeah, it just you know, everything goes crazy. I mean, it's like you can't even turn out the results. Okay. I mean, you'll, you, you'll hear of all kinds of stuff. I've heard of everything from people sucking on pennies. What? I've heard that word. So, uh, there's even people that claim that the people that really, really know, they've got a system, even on the, even on the, the uh, drug screens that have to be witnessed. Like a lot of times, you've got to go in the restroom with them. Like, and yeah. if you're female, you go in with females. If you're male, you go in with the males, and you're supposed to watch them. And I've even heard stories of you know people that have devices hooked up where they've got a tubing coming through to where it looks like the real deal, and it's somebody else's urine in a bag. That's what? crazy. Yeah. Somebody puts a lot of thought in that stuff. Yeah, I mean, they sell fake dicks. <laughs> you I don't have to. I mean, I don't just. Who yeah, thinks like have, that? Have you not? Did you not know they sell like fake dicks? Do they sell like fake dicks? And it's got ropey in it? They should catch it. That's the reason how. Come and see me. I mean, what guys don't do like liquor? Hard enough to. There's all kinds of things that they sell that are fake dicks. There's pig coming out. That's all I know. I was watching Law and Order. The pH is going to go up. The pH is going to go sky high. I heard vinegar works. There's also a supplement you can take called vinegar. That will make your pee and your sweat smell like maple syrup. Yeah, really? Yeah, when I was, after I had my daughter, because my C-section, uh, I had Tastic. trouble breastfeeding, and it's supposed to help you make breast milk. And it was, it's like strong. Sweat, pee, everything, maple syrup. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go over some of these. I know we need a we need a break, but give me about five more minutes to go okay. over some of your questions and then we'll take a break and use a four year review for the exam. Oh, Number one on page sixty seven. Uh, the concentration of a normal urine specimen can be estimated by which of the following? The concentration of the clarity. Color. Color. Oh, concentration. Again, if it's dark yellow, okay, it's probably concentrated. If it's pale yellow, it's diluted. Number two, the normal yellow color of urine is produced by what? Urochrome. Uh, number three, the presence of bilirubin in the urine specimen produces what? A. Yellow when shaken. Number four, urine specimen containing melanin will appear what? Black. Black. I wish they would oh, add to that upon right. standing because it will not be black the minute they do it. Upon standing. That'll be scary. Though. Number five, specimens that contain hemoglobin can be visually distinguished from those that contain impact or red blood cells because of what? Could it be A or C? I don't know. Which one. D. The answer is C. Red blood cells produce a cloudy red specimen. Red and cloudy means you should have impact red blood cells. Number six, a patient with a viscous orange specimen may have been a. treated for a urinary tract infection, and that is, they're, they're getting that correct. Uh, you know, you can make it. I don't know. Carrots. Number seven, the presence of a pink precipitate in a specimen that's been refrigerated may have been caused by what? C. Good. See, urethra. Oh, I didn't tell you guys this, but make sure you put an asterisk by number nine. The color of a urine containing porphyrins will be a port wine, port red wine. I didn't go over that in lecture, but I should have. Okay, okay. you need to know that. Oh, <coughs> number ten. Which of the following specific gravities would be most likely to correlate with a pale yellow urine? A. Yes, A, 1.005. Now, on the test, if you see something that says 1.002, that's a throw off answer because that's, I want you to know that's not urine. Right? It could be doctor. It could be doctor, but there, yes, it could be doctor and somebody added water. But anything less than 1.003 is not considered urine. Some books will tell you anything less than 1.004. 
Uh, number 13, a correlation exists between a specific gravity by a refractometer of 1.050 and what? William D. D, radiographic dye. That's the contrast, okay? Remember, a specific gravity of 1.050, that's, not, that's yeah. not happening either, okay? A urine will not be that high in specific gravity. Did we skip it one week long? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just jumping. I jump. I just look down and see something that I think you need to know. Okay. I, we don't, I mean, I'm not going to go over every single one of them, but just ones that stick out that I think, look, you should have gotten that. Um, let's see here. Number 12, the principle of refractive index is to compare what? Refractive index, that's what the refractometer uses, right? B. Yes, B, light velocity in air with light velocity in solution. Okay, one more thing I need to go over with you guys that I forgot about. Okay, so let's say, even though it's probably not real, and we look at a urine specimen on the refractometer, and we have a, you know, here's our refractometer grid, okay? And let's just say this is like 1.000 and this is 1.030. And let's just say that the curtain falls way above it, okay? So let's just say it goes, in other words, I call this going off the grid. It's so high, what we could estimate and say, well, it's probably around 1.050. There may be times where you have to do a dilution in order to get a specific gravity reading. Now, there's a trick to this that's not going to make sense to you guys, but I want to go over it because you're going to see it again. If I have a specific gravity, even though the patient we know had radiographic contrast media and it's probably not real, if it goes off the grid, I can dilute that urine specimen with water. I can do a one to two dilution, okay? If I do a one to two dilution and my curtain now goes down to the 1.030, Remember, I did a one to two, right? One part water, one part urine. I did a one to two dilution. The specific gravity reading, because I did a one to two dilution, it would not be, even though to me this is what would make sense, it would not be 2.060. It's 1.060. The one never changes. Okay, you got me? So if we did a one to five dilution, if I said, okay, I diluted a urine one to five, and I got a specific gravity reading of 1.005. The true answer would be 1.025, okay? So I just don't let that trick you. Whenever you dilute a urine for a specific gravity, the one, like, like 1.030, this never changes. The only thing that changes is right here, okay? Remember that, you're going to see it. All right. I think I've covered most of the stuff that I wanted to go over that. Oh, number 16, a specimen with a specific gravity of 1.001 would be considered Me. not urine. Okay. And I'm sure there's a question on it, but if I... I'm just not seeing it, but a urine that has a specific gravity of 1.010, there's a term for that. You guys remember what it's called? Isothenuric. Isothenuric, and that's the same specific gravity that the plasma filtrate has before going through the glomerulus. Remember that term, isothenuric. Okay, last thing for the break. A dilute urine, like 1.005, because it's so dilute, remember there's a lot of water in it, the substances that we see underneath the microscope, because that urine is dilute, eventually will start to swell and kind of burst, okay? So that's another reason, again, we, do, we, we try to stay on top of urines. You don't want them to sit for a long time, because if you leave a specimen that did have lots of white blood cells in it, if that urine is real dilute, that water eventually takes those white cells and it causes them to swell. If you look at it in time, you'll see them. But if you wait so long, those white cells bust. Same thing happens to the red cells, okay? 
And so just remember, it's not necessarily saying it in the book, but we want to test urines as soon as possible. Bad things can happen if you let them sit at room temperature. In a crystal form, which one is it? Is it calcium oxalate or is it tri uh, the, the, the phosphate? There's a crystal, if you let a urine sit long enough, the urine becomes real alkaline, like we were talking about, and the longer it sits, the more alkaline it becomes, all of a sudden you'll start seeing this crystal called triple phosphate. And that's, that's possible. Possible. Right. Okay, uh, let's take at least 15 minutes to